This is the tenth class, tenth session of the Synoptic Gospel Course of eCollege Saint. We are now on the last part of this course. It means that we are we have looked at the Synoptic Gospels as a whole, and then we cut it down into different pieces. And we looked at the different pieces. The last thing we are doing is looking at the three Gospels separately. First, Matthew, then Mark, and now we are going to look at the Gospel of Luke. Before that, we have to remember, and that is we have to do that all the time, we have to remember <clears throat> what we are doing uh, in, in this course. So. We have uh, there are two parts on the course. One is the the theoretical part. That's what we are doing now. And then we have the second part, which is a call what we call the ten hour practicum. So you have to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. You have to prepare a sermon on one of the similar texts in the Gospels, and then you can uh, look at the different Gospels and look at how they. Uh, relate to each other. So that is how you have to prepare um, uh, a sermon. And then <clears throat> you have to make make sure that you meet with a, a number of people, a, a, a group of people you know, friends, or it can be a Bible study group, or it can be a, a ladies Bible study, or a youth meeting, <clears throat> whatever. What you're going to do is you're going to bring them together, you're going to give them uh, the materials of the, the three Gospels and, and what you are asking them is, is to bring together what is similar and then to glue together the similarities. Eventually that will lead to, let me say it this way, one Gospel, that is the three Gospels in one. <clears throat> uh, the other thing you have to do is read the book, the Synoptic a problem, a way through the maze for Dr. Uh, Goodacre in the chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then you have to write a report on, on those chapters. <clears throat> okay, let's, let's look at how we are going to go about, because we have a, a certain way of looking looking at the the, the, uh, the Bible as such and since we are doing this in a certain way uh, we are setting a standard for ourselves and a standard uh, for you. <clears throat> there are four things, remember four things we are going to look at when we speak about the Word of God. First of all it is revealed. According to Jeremiah 30 we see that the word of God is being revealed to us. It's also inspired. We know the text of 2 uh, Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But it's also authoritative uh, for what I have received, uh, uh, received I passed on uh, as in the first importance in uh, 1, Cor 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 5. And then you have, it is living, the word of God is alive and active. Hebrews 4, verse 12. And so that is how we look at uh, the word of God. Revealed, inspired, authoritative, and living. That is how we are going to go about with the word of God. <clears throat> we looked at several issues already, like I said before. And so now we are going to look at the next thing. That is the book of Luke itself. Uh, let me let me be clear on this. Uh, Luke is the third gospel. The third gospel is not uh, the first one. Is the most important one. The third one is the, is is one of the least important ones. No, this is the third one in the sequence in the New Testament as we know it. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then we have John. So this is this is how it it is presented to us. So we are not going to change that. That is something that is historically being determined by the church 
the church as as a whole it, it's not that i've determined that or, or someone or a protestant has determined it or, or or a catholic or or an orthodox or a pentecostal no no such a thing when the church was still uh was was worldwide at that time worldwide as the people knew it at that time <clears throat> Uh, they called the uh, gatherings together. We call them the councils. One of the first council, the first council that's being held, is in Jerusalem in the year 50, around 50, with the apostles. And then you have later on you have other councils, and in in several of the councils they discuss the issues of what is being uh, preserved as the text that we call now the New Testament. And so they were fighting about it. They say, okay, what, what do we accept? Uh, some people say, we need to accept this book, and they need to accept another book. And then uh, eventually they came uh, to a consensus and say, okay, we are accepting the 27 books that are what is called now the New Testament. But you have to remember that is not the first time that those 27 books were mentioned because uh, at the end of the first century and the beginning of the second century, that's the, the time when uh, the Apostle John died and, and wrote uh, the, uh, the Apocalypse. Uh, at that, around that time, already the 27 books, as we know it in the New Testament, were available. And they were uh, circling around in the uh, church circles at that time. So it's, it's not that <coughs> the fourth generation uh, church decided that's the gospel or that's the, the New Testament. No, it was already there at the end of the first century. And all those books were accepted and were quoted and so on. So we know that this is something that we, we, we are sure about. So one of the books was, and, and that, is, that, is, that is the exception, you have to understand, you're talking about a exception, because uh, except for the Apostle Paul, which was a uh, one of the twelve, while one of the thirteen, uh, it was uh, the, this, his place was taken by Matthias. But we don't hear anything about Matthias anymore. And suddenly there uh, we have uh, the the thirteenth or the fourteenth apostle, when uh, around the same time as. Uh, James died, James the Apostle. I assume that James the Apostle was the writer of the book of James. Uh, so the book of James is, is one of the oldest of the New Testament. Paul took his place and then he started preaching, started writing, starting organizing. And, and actually through the work of Paul, we see the whole uh, region being evangelized. And one of the uh, people working with him is Luke. Uh, we will look at, at him as a person again, but let's look at the book itself right now. Okay. Luke, the, the Gospel of Luke is what we can call a compilation of various interviews. So Luke was actually going to interview uh, to uh, to talk to the people who were eyewitnesses. He himself was not an eyewitness. He was, uh, let me say, a second generation Christian in the sense that he was not as his father was a Christian, but he was the second generation in Christianity. Uh, so he came later after Jesus died, after Jesus was resurrected, after Jesus went to, uh, to heaven. So uh, Luke was not someone uh, who was in the... Uh, um, uh, around in the church in, in uh, during the time of Pentecost, although some people say he was one of the, the 72 who was sent out by Jesus. That's a maybe, but we don't have any proof of that. It sounds good and it may be, it may sound very pious, but I'm not sure um, we can prove any of that. The thing we have is that Luke is being accepted by the church as the writer of both the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. I renamed them. Uh, the Gospel is the Acts of Jesus, and then you have the Acts of the Apostles. So you have two times 
acts. Um, Luke himself is mentioned in the Bible, uh, and, and you can find him in Acts, Acts 16, Acts 16, the verse, verse 10. Let us read it, Acts 16, verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So the we, he is writing the book and he says, we. So the writer is also being mentioned here. He's referring to himself. And we have a whole range of texts where he is saying this, that we, he and others are working together, doing things together. And I think that is important for us to understand. I heard someone saying, okay, may, maybe maybe he was just quoting someone else and so on. Yeah, well, maybe, 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 but that's not what the Bible is teaching us. The, the, the maybes uh, are not here in the Bible. What, what we have is we have a text stating we. That means he is included. What we don't know is whether he ever met Jesus. We, we just assume he never met Jesus. He was not an eyewitness himself because he was going to the eyewitnesses to try to find out what the people uh, knew about Jesus. He had access to materials. We know that he had access to the book of Mark. We know he, uh, may, or he may have access, had access to uh, the book of Matthew. But there's also a possibility that the book of Matthew did not exist at that time and that the book of Matthew is actually written afterwards, after the book of Luke. Uh, I'm not going to discuss that further on, but just take that in, uh, take that on board and just think about it. So what we know is that Luke, according to Colossians 4.14, is a physician. We call that a medical doctor today. Uh, that's fine. Uh, when you call him doctor, fine. When you call him um, uh, medical, that's also fine. What we know is, is a smart man. I mean, he's not just an ordinary man with, uh, with uh, 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 primary school education or something. No, he is a man who is well trained. He speaks Greek, as his, most probably as his first language, and he's educated in Greek. What he does is um, he goes and try to find out for himself what uh, what happened. And you can uh, when you, you go back to the book of of Luke, uh, the first chapter, the first um, the introduction, the, the first chapter in the first verse, it says many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. I, I was all, I'm always amazed by the word fulfilled here. Just as they were handed down to us okay, by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So he's uh, writing to a, a fellow Christian with the name of Theophilus, and in many cases, and that's almost always in the, the biblical sense, uh, all the names have, have value, uh, they, 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 they have a meaning. And in this case, the meaning of the word of the name Theophilus means uh, he's a lover of God. He loves God. So that may be his Christian name. Maybe, okay, because love of God can be something else than just loving 
the Lord God as we know the Lord God. But uh, let's assume that's his name. And since Luke is writing to him, and he calls them the most excellent, uh, he uses that for Festus and for Felix later on in the book of, uh, of Acts. So it's, it's the, same, the same way of looking at a certain person. So I'm, I, I think it's very clear that we are talking about a real person, not someone imaginary or everyone who loves the Lord. I don't think that's what it means here. What Luke is doing, he is going into the, 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 the pool of, of witnesses and he, he sits down with them uh, and then uh, I don't know whether he made notes or, or, or he learned by heart uh, that is not really that important except if he made notes and the notes are being handed down to us as part of the gospel well it's still part of the gospel it is not part of the text of the gospel as we know it but it can be the, 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 the reference point for, for Luke, knowing that he wrote those materials down with an eyewitness as source. So what is Luke doing? Uh, he's going to go into details. For example, he has a good relationship with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and he goes and talks to her. And she's giving him a whole range of specifics, of details, of things uh, he needs to know, we need to know. And that is what we're getting from the book of Luke. A very well documented uh, material on, uh, on Jesus in the background. So he is talking to Mary. So we hear about the extended family, we hear about um, Elizabeth, and we hear about uh, John the Baptist, that, that's family of Jesus. We hear about the angel Gabriel who met with Mary, Mary talks about it, and so on. Uh, so with, with Elizabeth and, and, and Mary, you have uh, two mothers, two women, uh, the one is at the beginning of uh, of her time as, a, as 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 a possible mother, and the other one is at the end. Actually, you can almost say after, behind, too, too far away, after the end of being a mother. But she it becomes a mother anyway. So you have two women, two pregnant women, meeting each other. One at one end and one at the other end in, in what we call the age, age range. Um, Luke is also very specific on, for example, the the the, uh, the circumcision of, of Jesus, of uh, the the purification of, of Mary when she goes back to the temple, and and so on. You know the the the, the things that are. Um, you can almost say not important to us as such, but they are important for the Jewish readers. Or the Jews, if, if that was not even mentioned, then the Jews say, oh, you know, uh, it's not complete. Well, that's what we have here. He is making the Gospels complete. He's writing about things nobody else writes. And he has a whole range of things he's writing about. And that is important for each and every one of us. All the Gospels have unique material. So Luke also has unique material. He wants to show Jesus in his humanity. So in his humanity it means the birth, the circumcision, um, the presentation at the temple, when he was a young boy, when he was uh, older, uh, the difficulties in life, things like that. All are in, uh, in the book. You can almost say he's specializing on the uh, humanity of Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. 
uh, for example, he remains in the temple. Uh, his mother and his father are, are upset because they can't find him. When they go back home, they think he's with the other one and, and nobody knows. And then they go back to the temple, find that Jesus is teaching, teaching as a 12 year old because he was doing his uh, bar mitzvah. Uh, is teaching uh, the teachers of the law. And when mother and father come, they say, oh, why, why, did, why did you do that for me? And then uh, she said, well, I, I have to do my father's thing. That's why I'm called. That's why I'm here. I'm not here because of you. I'm here because of the father sent me to be here among those scholars they need to know when they ask questions they need to know great man great Jesus but he's still a young boy and then he goes into I can almost say submission and, and is, uh, is being obedient to his parents for another 18 years until he finally breaks off of the family and goes on into his ministry Okay, so that, that's what we have. You can almost say that Luke recognizes from the beginning, or at least very early, he recognizes that Jesus is, um, is, is very special. He is the Messiah. But what does it mean to be? the Messiah. One of the issues is that uh, Luke is describing that, that the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, are united in one specific area when Jesus Christ is being baptized, the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove and you hear the voice of the Father. The three are gathered together. And, I'm not saying that is unique, it is unique, but what I'm saying is that is how Luke is trying to explain to his readership. Readership must be born again Christians who need support uh, for what they believe. They need a, a piece of paper or black and white. And so that's what he's, that's what he's getting. And, he is the one, uh, Luke is the one who is speaking the most about the Holy Spirit. And you can say that's, that's kind of strange because first of all he is an outsider, secondly he's not a Jew, so why is he talking about the Holy Spirit? He is the one who leads you to Jesus and he, he, look, he, he shows that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and you will see that in, in many different aspects of the life of Jesus. Um, he's led out into the wilderness. He's doing things in the power of the Spirit. Uh, the, the power, the, the Spirit descends on him. See, all those things are not written um, because we like to hear that. They are written with a very very specific issue in mind he is uh, Luke is explaining that the uh, Jesus is not just a man it's not just a anointed one no he's the anointed one and what is special about the anointed one we will look at it very soon because he is the Christ Christ is the same word of anointed one or the Messiah this is saying uh, the, 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 the same thing so we, we don't have we have different words but it's just because of different languages so the Holy Spirit anoints Jesus uh, in his growing up to his uh, messiahship he is the messiah but now he is officially according to Jewish tradition and law so what is he anointed for and that's that's the you can almost say that's the most important issue of the whole gospel. It's it's like it's the most important issue of the Bible. What is Jesus anointed for? He has been anointed to do what? According to the text, 
Isaiah 61 verse 1 and 2. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom, that's liberty, to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What is the acceptable year of the Lord? The acceptable year of the Lord is the, the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee is a very, very spe specific thing in Judaism. It is the year, that time, when everything is being set upside down. For example, um, you have a family and they have misfortune. That's how we say it. Um, and uh, they, they have to work as Jews for other Jews. So they are paid. But if that's not enough, some families are being sold as slaves to fellow Jews. So they can um, lower the amount of money they have to pay. When, when you do that, you have to understand that uh, the, the new owner is now the owner of the debt. So he pays the debt to the other uh, people who have invested in those in, the, in that family. So now he is the one with the debt and he is trying to recuperate his money from, uh, from his slaves. In the year of the Jubilee, all the debts are cancelled. All the debts are cancelled. No more debts. So this, the, the people who are sold in, in slavery, the, the, the people who had land given to someone else as a, as a down payment or something, everything is being turned around again and the start is, is you can almost say like in year zero. That is what is happening. The, the problem you face in the Bible is that um, it's not clear, it's not clear that the Jewish people ever kept this, the year of the Jubilee. Maybe they thought that was needed for the Messiah. So Jesus is actually going into that idea and saying, okay, I am now going to do all those things. I'm proclaiming peace. I'm proclaiming healing. I'm proclaiming freedom. I'm proclaiming opening of prisons. So Jesus is the top representative of the year of Jubilee. With him, all those things that are not being done by the Jews, although they should have done it, but they didn't do it, or we have no recollection, we never find any, any recollection of it. So this is what Jesus is doing. He's undoing the wrong things the people did to their own families and to their own uh, fellow countrymen and fellow tribesmen. Uh, and then uh, now you have Jesus, <clears throat> the Messiah. And, and, and of course, that was not something that was visible in the sense as, uh, as having an army or building a fortress, or, or building a city, or, or fighting the Romans. No, it was much more into uh, the, the Jewish people themselves. He was going into their lives. But you know, when, um, when you read the book, um, let, me, let me see. Luke 14, verse 24. Let's look at it. Uh, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will 
get the taste of the banquet. That's the story about the, 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 the parable of the banquet, when, uh, when people are invited to come and, and everyone has a reason not to come. And so Jesus, and the, um, the, the owner said, you know, uh, if you don't come, you're not welcome anymore. So they will not even taste from the banquet. That has to do with the idea of, uh, of, of Jesus being the, the, the giver um, of the year of Jubilee, the Jubilee time. When is this when is this whole thing happening? It is um, when when Jesus is is quoting quoting from the book of uh, Isaiah when he opens the book of Isaiah and reads out loud and uh, the people understand what he is saying. Well, not completely, but they understand at least some of the materials. So they have a good idea, but they don't have the right and complete idea. Um, there are two parts, and Jesus stops at the uh, he ends his, his reading just before he speaks about, or the text speaks about, the day of vengeance. Because that day of vengeance is not yet. That's still in the future. The judgment still in the future but the year of jubilee is there and it's running today and the year of jubilee that's the church that's the time the era of the church and that's you and me and that's what luke is trying to explain so we, slaves are set free uh, it's it's you know debts are cancelled land is restored it all starts with the, the feast of the Passover. So that is how you have to look at it. So those things are there. The miracles of Jesus will highlight the main features of him as a Messiah, the Messiah of the, uh, the time of Jubilee. He proclaims the acceptable year of the Lord. That is the Jubilee. Yeah? Um, he brings the gospel to the poor, the broken, he heals the brokenhearted, he gives liberty, opens the prison doors, and then he proclaims the acceptable year. Um, when Luke uh, interviews the, the people, um, he's trying, to, to, trying to, to extract the materials in, in such a way that uh, that they are telling what uh, he has in mind as background of the whole story of Jesus. So this is also uh, a, a way of looking at it. That is not negative, that's positive. That's very positive to look for the positive issues. Um, to do so, Luke is, is trying to find out a number of materials teachings that are not being recorded by Mark or Matthew. And he finds them in the parables, 15, or even more parables, but at least 15. They all look, or they all speak about the year of the Jubilee. The creditor and his debtors, the rich fool, the faithful and evil servants, the counting of the cost, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, the unjust uh, steward, the rich man in Lazarus, the ten slaves and and the coins but uh, he's also taking he has this idea of, of jesus taking care of the needs the good samaritan the friend you need he avenges uh, the oppressed widow you see he has an intake different from his jewish neighbors and now he's bringing um a a gentile idea and, and, and you know, Gentiles, that's you and me. So we are much more linked to him than to the other three gospel writers. Keep in mind, don't forget, keep in mind, we are talking about the fulfillment of the year of Jubilee. That is the issue.
Uh, and you would think that Jesus would only do great things, nice things, wonderful things. People wonder, ah, wow, what a, what a man, what a man, what a, what a prophet, uh, what, a, what a sage or something. No, there are other things. He's also preparing, at the same time he's preparing his, his, his followers to become disciples, to become apostles. But he's also preparing them as a group and saying four times, not just once, four times he's predicting. He says, I am going to suffer to Jerusalem. So the whole book is actually one long time saying one way to go to Jerusalem. So every detail of the Passover is fulfilled in Christ. Keep, do, you keep, do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? The year of Jubilee. Ah, yeah, here we are. All the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 12, the, verse 3. That was a promise to, to Abraham, but it's a promise to you today. Do you understand? Okay, and then and then you have this. It's 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 like a, a counterpart story. Um, then you have the story about Zacchaeus, also a unique story uh, in in the book of Luke. You have to understand Jericho is the lowest city on earth, 150 meter under the sea under the level of the sea, 150 meters. Even today you can go there and, and visit those areas. So Jericho is lower than sea level. And there you have, uh, in that city you have a lowest of the lowest, which is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a tax collector, not just a tax collector. You can almost say the tax collector, the chief tax collector of uh, Jericho. Jesus calls him. We, we all know the story. He was too short and he went uh, uh, to hide in the um, uh, in a tree, sycamore tree, and he tries to see Jesus. And then when Jesus comes by, he says, Zacchaeus, 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 come in. I want to be with you. I'm coming down to this earth, to the lowest part of the earth, and I'm coming down to visit you because you're the lowest of the lowest, and I'm going, I'm going to visit you. I'm going to be in your family. I'm going to be in your house. I'm going to eat with you. <gasps> no, you can't do that. Oh, the Pharisees, the scribes, the scholars. Oh no, what is he going to do now? Jesus calls those who are uncallable. Is that even English? The people who are not supposed to be called. He calls them. He called me. He calls you. He calls the ones who are downtrodden, deep in the earth, 150 meter. And then Jesus says, today, Today, salvation has come to this house. That's the meaning. He came to seek to save the lost, the total lost. You know, when you have a car, you have an accident with your car, and, and your car is irreparable. It's total lost. That's that's the man Zacchaeus. He was total lost. No salvation possible, except for Jesus. From that moment on, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. And the, the whole thing in the book is all about his enter to Jerusalem. People come to him and they, 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 they say, you know, uh, do we have to pay taxes? And Jesus says, show me a coin. What's on the coin? Well, it's Caesar. So he says, give Caesar what is Caesar's, give God what is God's. Okay, let's look at the look at look himself, the author. 
like I said, the third gospel is written by the same person as uh, as the book of Acts. We know because it's with the similarity of the introduction, we are quite sure. We, of course, we don't know whether that Luke, because in a sense, uh, it's not mentioned. But the early church said it was Luke. So there's no reason for us to doubt. Oh yes, in the 19th century. Suddenly, <gasps> oh, how can we think it was Luke? It's never mentioned. Well, it was mentioned by the church. The group of people saying it was Luke. Luke wrote it. They knew him. He was still alive at that time. We have the wee sections in Acts. We have the author. Okay, let me let me say it this way. Let's let's look at it. The author of Acts was probably one of Luke's companions, listened in in the letters during this during that same period. Luke is listed in Colossians 4, 14, 2 Timothy 4, 11, Philemon 24. And not one of those refer to in the third person, in the we sections. So we have, um, semantically, speaking about the text, a proof that who is he? He's not an eyewitness. Is a Gentile. Um, you can almost say he writes down the gospel of Paul. It's called the gospel of Luke because he's the writer. But anyway, okay. So, what's the earliest date? Let's let's look at it. The book of Acts is a second book of uh, the two books. Acts ends before. Paul is being uh, convicted or uh, jailed uh, and uh, the, 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 the it's, it's, not the, it's not carried out. I mean, this, the sentence is not carried out. We don't, we don't have any proof in the book of Acts. That's what I'm saying. Okay, So the book ends before all this. Why? Well, most probably because Luke wrote the book before that was ever to happen. So we know that Paul was killed in in the time of Nero around uh, 65, 67. So the book was written earlier than 65, 67. That's the book of Acts. And we know that the book of Acts was preceded by the book of Luke. So we know that was earlier. The, the, the idea is that uh, Luke wrote it while Paul was imprisoned. And so he had time, two years time to go around and visit the people. So that's probably what he did. So he wrote the book in the years 57, 59, somewhere there, after the book of Mark. So the book of Mark is, is earlier. That's beginning of 50. And the notes, uh, one of the notes we find is, is even in the, in the 40s, so about the book of Mark. So we have uh, a whole timeline here. So, there are no details of Paul's trial. There's no mentioning of the terrible uh, persecution. There's no mentioning of the temple being burned down or, being, or the city of Jerusalem uh, fell in the hands of, of the enemy. Um, so we can be sure that the book was written before that. Some people say, no, 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 no. It was because in, in chapter 1, verse 8, it says that they were going to the end of the earth and, and Rome is the end of the earth. And I was always doubted about it. I said, I said, why would they say that? Oh, because of the capital city, the most sinful, sin, the most sinful city in, in, the, in the universe at that time. Maybe true, but that's not the end of the earth. So it, it has to do with, with people claiming that the book was written later are saying that 
you have to interpret in uh, interpret interpret a, 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 a specific text in chapter 1 verse 8 in a specific way only in that way and, and, and that's too weak an argument so I don't think they have a good argument for the date and of course and, and uh, people claim it it was it was done before uh, Peter was uh, crucified we don't know anything about Peter being crucified that's not in the Bible okay let's let's look at the book itself as what what, what is the genre of the book it's it's a narrative it has um, stories parables accounts um, it, it's very lively very vivid it has a very fine description it, it, it's 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 done in, in uh, you can almost say perfect Greek of that time um, Luke is bringing the uniqueness of Christ to the forefront the miracles the teachings the conflict across the claims all things are there he's presenting the life of Jesus and it's all going in, in, in one line going up to Jerusalem let's look at some uh, settings and themes uh, for example God is sovereign uh, and he rules sovereignly in, in, in history and over history <coughs> a whole range of texts 13 verse 33 22 verse 22 Acts 1 to 16 to 17 uh, the arrival and actual presence of the kingdom of God we are not talking about the consummation of the kingdom we are talking about the presentation so the, the, the consummation is a future event but we have the blessed hope for which the church prays is the presence Luke 11 2 11 20 16 verse 16 17 20 to 21 18 verse 1 to 8 21 verse 27 to 29 and so on okay I'm, I'm not going to go into those uh, details the coming and indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus and the followers when Jesus was baptized he got the Holy Spirit I mean the Holy Spirit was uh, uh, visible on him when you go to the book of John um, almost almost at the end of the book you have a very strange story Um, on the evening that's chapter 20 verse 19 on the evening of that of that first day of the week when the disciples were together so they came together on the first day of the week that's a Sunday with the doors closed locked for fear of the Jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this he showed him his hands and his sight and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord and again verse 21 again Jesus said peace be with you that's the second time as the Father sent me I'm sending you and then we have this unique thing that's happening read verse 22 and with that he breathed on them and he said receive the Holy Spirit what do you think happened at that time did the people receive the Holy Spirit or not those are the are the disciples those are the Apostles did they receive the Holy Spirit when Jesus said receive the Holy Spirit I don't think you have to doubt about it I think it's completely sure that they received the Holy Spirit did they speak in tongues <coughs> no nope. do you know why because they all spoke the same language 
speaking in tongues is speaking another language. But anyway, um, we are not going to go into that. But that is a text in God's word explaining. That is, listen, that is the day of the resurrection. That specific day. You can prove that in, in, in Luke and so on and so on. But this is what is happening. So, the Holy Spirit comes unto them. With the Holy Spirit, they go into seclusion for 10 days. And then, that, that's, that's later on, they are 40 days with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit working in them and on them. And uh, then you have uh, the ascension, then you have the 10 days between ascension and, and um and Pentecost, and then you have Pentecost, and then you have the Holy Spirit coming over to the other people. The Holy Spirit is central. The Holy Spirit is central to the message of Luke in his Gospel and in the Book of Acts. In the Book of Acts, you have three times you have what what you can call the Pentecost. First you have the Pentecost in chapter 2, then you have the Pentecost in chapter 8, and then you have the Pentecost in chapter 10 and, 12, and 11. That is the Pentecost for the Jews, that's the Pentecost for the Samaritans, and that's the Pentecost for the Gentiles. That's how it works. That's how it functions. So then, and that's another thing, the great um, reversal takes place. It's no longer for the Jews only, now it is for, for the whole world. It, it was meant for the whole world. Jew, I mean, Judaism is not for the Jews. Judaism is for the whole world. But they kind of forgot to evangelize. So the church has to do what the Jews didn't do. And that's what happened. So that's, big, that's part of the... Uh, uh, reversal. God's love for the for the poor, God's love for the tax collectors, for the outcasts, the sinners, the women, the Samaritans, the Gentiles. Wow! That's what is happening. Great things are in that book of the book of Luke. Wow, man! The believers are to live a life of prayer. You can. I can ask you. Did you pray tomorrow this morning? Did you pray this morning? Now, what was the contents of your prayer? Lord bless me, bless the whole world, amen? Or did you pray a very specific way? Family, did you, na did you name your brothers and sisters, your father, your mother, your uncles, your, the church members in church? Did you mention them? That's what you have to do. Prayer is a major point in the book of Luke because Luke knows, we're going to say, as no other knows, that prayer is important. Prayer was important in Jesus' life. But whenever Jesus was going to do something very special, specific or special, for example, choose the 12 disciples to make them apostles, he prayed at night. Uh, before the uh, the transfiguration, he prayed at night. Before teaching, he prayed at night. Before the, um, uh, the, 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 the multiplication of the, the bread and, and, and the fish, he prayed at night. That's how Jesus is. That's what we have to do. So this, uh, the, the next thing is the danger of riches. When you have too much money, you tend to look at the money rather than to the one who gives the money. And the money that's been given to you, that is not the government. That is not your employer. No. That's God. That's the Lord God. He provides for you. And He knows what you need. Some people need more, some people need less. Maybe you're the, you're the one who needs less. Accept it. You know, let me let me tell you just a little story, because we already are over time here. Uh, let, let, me, let me go on. Sorry, let, let, let's let's.
Okay, let's let, let's look at the uh, the similarity between the book of Acts and the book of Luke. See, uh, the book of the, the gospel is the, the, the Acts of Jesus. The Acts is the book of the Acts of Apostles. You have uh, Jesus was brought to Jerusalem. It all starts in Jerusalem. For 40 days in the desert, you have 40 days waiting for the ascension. You have the ministry starting in uh, Jesus in, in Samaria and Judea. You have Samaria and Judea in, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. You have the Decapol the, the Decapolis, uh, and you have Asia Minor. It, it balances out. Jesus with the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, the non-apostles receive the Holy Spirit, preaches the gospel with power, apostle preached with power. Jesus heals the six, the apostles have the uh, healing ministry, the dead of Jesus, the dead of, of, of uh, first martyr Stephen. Uh, apostles were sent out to the nations, G Paul preaches in Rome. It's, you can almost say it's almost unbelievable how strong these things are J just give me just give me one one more second uh, the, a number of symbols being used for uh, the gospels uh, the gospel of john the eagle the gospel of luke a calf just uh, the gospel of matthew a, a man and gospel of, of uh, mark a lion and then you have an explanation about the, uh, the name of Jesus and the spelling and, and why it's built, spelled that way. So I, I think you have now enough material to, to do what you have to do. And, I'm, and the only thing I can say here is God bless you.